Thank you. Thank you very much, Abe. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the honor of speaking here with you today as we remember the heroes of 1983. General Gray, my mentor, Mayor Phillips, other distinguished guests, and particularly the families of the Marines, the sailors, and the soldiers of Beirut. I have no expectations this morning that this morning's remembrance and honor ceremony is any less painful for you in 2013 than it was in 1983. Your fellow Marines and your fellow family members grieve with you. Despite the memories and the pain, thank you for being with us this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, each of you and I know full well why we have gathered here today. We understand the meaning of our gathering. For those of us that still wear this cloth, and for those of you that wore the cloth in the past, you understand that this is a heavy-hearted day for the nation and especially for its Corps of Marines. Looking back in history, the early 1980s was a tumultuous time of conflicting powers. It indeed became the harbinger of much more difficult and challenging times yet to come. Tensions were high across the world as the Cold War raged on and radicalism surfaced as a new threat to the stability in the Middle East. When conflict ripped at the peaceful coexistence in Lebanon, the United States, France, Italy, and Great Britain answered the call to assist. Marines set out to establish an environment which would permit the Lebanese Armed Forces to maintain security and stability throughout the Beirut area. The U.S. involvement in peacekeeping operations in Beirut for the next year and a half would redefine the world that we currently live in today. The Marines that served in Beirut as part of multinational peacekeeping force made a difference. They stood watch, patrolled chaotic streets to provide a blanket of safety and security and comfort for the citizens of Lebanon. They stood for freedom. But they also knew that their mission was not without risk. And then on October the 23rd, 1983, on a morning much like today, terror struck. At 6.22 a.m., extremists drove an explosive-laden truck into the Marine barracks, the likes of which had never been witnessed before. A massive explosion shook the ground of the entire Beirut International Airport, along with the souls of all the Marines throughout the world. 220 Marines. 18 sailors and three soldiers were lost in the attack. 241 Marines and Americans and soldiers and sailors that volunteered to make a difference. They volunteered to serve their country. 241 that put the lives and the freedoms of others before their own. 241 of our nation's finest. We honor each of them here today with this ceremony. It's important to understand the significance of October the 23rd and to put it now in historic, historical context. The attacks on the Marine barracks and the U.S. Embassy in Beirut a few months earlier really defined the beginning of what became known today as the War on Terror. The world we live in and what we knew of the future security environment changed forever that morning of October the 23rd. At the time, Bonnie and I were in Meridian, Mississippi. I was a young major and a flight instructor in advanced jet training. But like each of us, I remember the day well. My training and the training of the new pilots at the time was built around an eventual showdown with the former Soviet Union. This was a carryover from old thought, from history as we believed it would be written and our understanding of traditional warfare in that day. That all changed in Beirut on October of 1983. 
The nation was not expecting this. It was a new kind of warfare. The threat of radical extremists being able to target military and civilian personnel with weapons of mass destruction for political, religious, and personal gains. It was a new way to attack the West. It was a cowardly attack on freedom. If you look back at the last 30 years, beginning in Beirut, Extremists have attempted to destroy what makes this nation great by attacking America at home and abroad. On June 25, 1996, terrorists detonated a truck bomb adjacent to an eight-story structure in Saudi Arabia housing U.S. Air Force personnel, killing 19 and wounding 498. They attacked our embassies in Kenya and Tanzania in 1998 killing over 220 people and wounding over 4,000. The attack against the USS Cole in October of 2000 while harbored in Yemen resulted in 17 sailors killed and 39 injured. On 9-11, terrorists attacked America in New York in the fields of Shanksville, Pennsylvania and the Pentagon, killing nearly 3,000. We remember each of these well. We will never forgive, nor will we ever forget. Just last year, gunmen attacked our embassy in Benghazi, killing five, including our U.S. Ambassador, Ambassador Stevens. Not only are these world-changing events, but they are very personal to all of us here today. We have responded in places like Yemen, Somalia, Mali, Libya, Afghanistan, in Iraq. Across the globe where extremists, extremists have attempted to plot against our freedom and our democracy. They have tested our resolve as a nation. Those men who died 30 years ago today would be proud to know that we have never relented. We've never backed down and we never will. I want to talk briefly this morning about one of the Marines who's honored on the wall behind me, Sergeant Manuel Cox. We're honored to have some of his family here with us today. I'm told his wife, Evie, and her son, Anthony. Sergeant Cox was born in Havana, Cuba in 1963. Came to the United States with his mother when he was one year old. His mother passed away due to cancer when Manuel was only 14 years old and he fended for himself as an orphan until he turned 17 when he joined the United States Marine Corps. Manuel found solace and camaraderie in the Corps, and he excelled. He was rewarded for his strength of character and his work ethic. He was rewarded for his strength of character and his work ethic with meritorious promotions to Lance Corporal, to Corporal, to Sergeant. He was an admired NCO by his peers and his juniors, reliable by his commanders, and a dedicated man to his family. In 1983, Sergeant Cox was a squad leader with Gulf Company, 2nd Battalion, 8th Marines. For those that remember, 2-8 was the designated battalion landing team for the 22nd Marine Amphibious Unit, who relieved the 24th Mao in Lebanon after the bombing in the barracks. Sergeant Cox, along with seven other members of his squad, manned Observation Post 76 on the west side of the Beirut International Airport, just over a month after the terrorists struck our barracks. Two days prior, Evie had given birth to their son, Anthony. In a conversation with his company commander, Sergeant Cox was given the option to return home to take care of his newborn son. He handed the Marine captain a cigar and said, Skipper, my wife and my baby are fine. My men are here. My duty is here. While standing guard on December the 4th, OP-76 came under intense enemy fire in a further attempt to exploit coalition losses in Beirut and to test the capabilities of the new U.S. forces, those new Marines 
that were on the ground in Beirut. The engagement lasted for well over three hours. Sergeant Cox and his squad were clearly outgunned. By all accounts, the fighting was ferocious. He called for and adjusted artillery fire and mortars and gave fire commands to his gunners. As some put it, Sergeant Cox and his Marines fought like hell that night. Regretfully, Observation Post 76 was hit by indirect fire, taking the lives of Sergeant Manuel Cox and seven more of our nation's finest. Sergeant Cox was an inspiration to those that served with him, as were the other Marines and sailors and soldiers that we remember today. Though it seems they were taken suddenly and it remains difficult to understand the purpose for which they left us, I am confident they would be proud of the legacy that continues because of their sacrifice. Turn the clock forward with me to today's Marine Corps, if you will, please. Sean Stokes was only 10 months old in Fremont, California, when Sergeant Cox was in the fight of his life in Beirut. Sean wouldn't understand the significance of the barracks bombing until many years later. But like Sergeant Cox, Sean felt a calling to serve his nation. Sean Stokes entered the Marine Corps on October the 15th, 2001, a little bit more than 30 days after 9-11. He was an excellent athlete, an avid, out, an avid outdoorsman and sportsman, and by all accounts from his fellow Marines, a moral compass for his unit. During the Battle of Fallujah in November of 2004, Corporal Stokes was assigned to Lima Company, 3rd Battalion, 1st Marines. He was the point man for his squad. As fighting raged for days in house-to-house -house combat, Corporal Stokes never backed down and, never ref and refused to leave his Marine brothers even after having been wounded himself several times. He continuously advanced against heavily armed enemy positions, engaged in close quarters combat, and selflessly protected his fellow Marines rather than himself when members of his squad came under intense enemy fire. Stokes walked point each day of the battle. He was the first Marine down every street, in every house, in every room, hundreds of rooms. He was the first Marine to be attacked by the enemy and the first to report the situation to his squad leader. Bullets, grenades, rockets, and roadside bombs were around every corner. His bravery and composure in the harshest of conditions were an inspiration to all that served with him. He was what we call a legend. Even though Sean didn't want recognition, he was awarded the Silver Star for his actions in Fallujah in 2004. Sean was killed in Anbar province 45 days into his third combat tour. Investigating an area of possible roadside bombs, Sean again took point, and he died due to an improvised explosive device, and no doubt, by doing so, save the lives of countless of his brothers. Ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, one thing that is consistent since that fateful day in Beirut 30 years ago, the character and the courage of the U.S. Marines has not wavered, and it never will. As we sit here today, our Marines remain forward deployed. Three Marine Expeditionary Units are staged around the globe today, the 26th, the 13th, and the 31st. Marines continue to train security forces and deny terrorists safe havens throughout all of Afghanistan. Marines are deployed with special purpose Marine Air Ground Task Forces to respond to crisis in, in Africa and in throughout the Levant. Our Marines are as strong as ever, ready to respond, ready to answer our nation's clarion call. Ladies and gentlemen, family members, Bonnie and I are honored to be a part of this ceremony today. We've looked forward to being here with you for months. It's our honor to be in your presence today. God bless you. Thank you, the city of Jacksonville, for your great fidelity towards its Marines and our family members, and for the leadership of this great MEF and this base. Ladies and gentlemen, God bless the United States of America and Semper Fidelis.
Thank you, Commandant. Your leadership and your remarks are certainly appreciated. A former Commandant himself, General Al Gray, is regarded as a, a Marine's Marine. Known for his compassion and concern for the Marines and sailors, this former Commandant always seemed more comfortable amongst than talking with Marines, sailors, and civilian Marines than in some of his other duties. General Gray's leadership was strong, firm, and purposeful. On this day 30 years ago, General Gray was the commander of the 2nd Marine Division. On the afternoon of this day, he stood in front of a horde of reporters and on live television and radio gave the status of the injured, the care for the dead, and offered the compassions of the Marine Corps for the families. Beloved in this community, well respected within the Corps, General Gray returns to this consecrated space to reflect, share, General Alfred M. Gray. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, I guess you uh, you don't have anything else to do, but uh, th thank you, Abe, and, and thank you for that uh, very warm welcome. It's really me that should uh, should applaud you because uh, you gave me a chance to com com come back home this morning. Thank you. I want to add my thanks to the Beirut uh, committees and to all the people, not only here, but uh, throughout this great community for what they've done to uh, remember us and for all time. And particularly, uh, I, my thoughts are about Doris Downs today as well and, and what she did, and, uh, and the good Lord is with her, but uh, thank you all. I also want to say to our Beirut families, our loved ones, our friends, and goodness sakes, now there are our daughters and sons that are growing up, and I've met granddaughters and grandsons today and all of that. And when I, when I look at you and when I remember, I say uh, my prayers have been answered because I've been, uh, I've been thinking about you for 30 years now, every morning and every evening, and, uh, and this morning uh, my prayers have come true. So hang in there. Keep doing what you're doing. I also want to say to all here that uh, the warriors did not die in vain, and we must remember that, and we must keep that uppermost in our minds. For example, after the Beirut bombing, for the first time, the United States of America recognized that terrorism is a form of warfare, and we got to get on with it. For the first time, we established a counterterrorism center in Washington with all the services under the auspices of the Central Intelligence Agency and began to get serious about what this was really, really all about. The brilliant performance of all of the armed services, all the men and women, and particularly in our nation's Corps of Marines, our young men and women have not deployed from anywhere in the United States or in Okinawa or wherever they may be, have not deployed once since the 23rd of October 1983 without remembering their fallen heroes, their warriors, and remembering their families. And that performance, their performance everywhere, whether it's Afghanistan, Iraq, the Horn of Africa, the Philippines, you name it, has been nothing but superb. And so the legacy lives on. The legacy lives on. There's also the matter of medicine and medical care. Today, as we all know, wounded warriors are coming up military medicine. We've got to do something about Air Force, Navy, and Army medicine. We've got to get with it. We've got to learn how to treat mass casualties. We've got to learn how to really get serious about this. We've got to learn how to treat them en route in airplanes. We've got to learn to have forward 
medical care, forward surgery. We've got to learn how to save lives without all the tools that you have in a remote hospital. And they did all of that, and finally they said, we've got to get the American services, the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force with it and work together. And that's why, my friends, today you see many, many more wounded warriors alive with a chance to, to get on with their lives. Numbers-wise, about, about really now, uh, my last, uh, and I quoted this figure uh, in Boston this weekend. I was at the Boston uh, Beirut Memorial Service as well, and uh, I quoted the figure of 5,000 plus because uh, that was in 2010. I've uh, done my homework over the weekend, and over 7,000 American warriors are alive today because of the medicine and the procurement and all of that that has happened since the Beirut bombing. For those of you who like, for those of you who, uh, who like to dabble in statistics, 20-some uh, years ago, 17% of those people would have been dead. Today, it's only 7%, so a, a better than 10% improvement. So that's another part of the legacy that we don't think about much and that you don't, you don't hear about very often. You know, we, uh, we took casualties from 36 states plus the District of Columbia and the one corpsman from the Republic of the Philippines. So it really touched our country uh, to the whole. And yet we, we haven't looked back. And the one thing that we did on the 4th of November on that rainy day when we had the memorial service, and many of you were with us together, when we had that memorial service at Camp Lejeune, where the President of the United States and Mrs. Reagan with several senators and congressmen, with our then Commandant General P.X. Kelly, who, by the way, sends you all his very, very best. Paul's having a little bit of medical problems these days, but he's with you in spirit. And he made, he, he told both Jim and I both the other night, make damn sure that you tell him that I'm thinking about him. But anyway, we said at that, uh, we said at that memorial service, we said, uh, you'll never be forgotten. And uh, thanks to the, to the great city of Jacksonville, uh, you've made it happen. It's, it's the Jacksonville and Onslow County and, and really the great state of North Carolina together, pulling together, has made uh, this event happen and, and it will continue to, uh, to happen as I understand it. And thank you very much from the, from the hearts and minds of all of us here today. I could go on and on and on, but it's already been pretty long and you've already been here for a long time. Many of you have been here since 6 o'clock this morning and it was great to see you. So my message, as always, is uh, take care of yourselves, take care of each other. God bless you, and God bless America.